Coming up, a new vision for reporting. We need a type of journalism, in my view, that can anchor uh, public opinion, that can serve as a trustworthy and reliable source of relevant information about public affairs. Harvard's Thomas Patterson discusses infotainment, the role of journalism in a democracy, and how to make informed reporters. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Tom Patterson is a Benjamin C. Bradley Professor of Government and the Press at the Joan Shorenstein Center on the Press, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. His book, Informing the News, The Need for Knowledge-Based Journalism, is a result of a multi-year study on the future of journalism which involved 11 journalism schools across the nation. This initiative looked at ways journalism could be transformed to meet the needs of a complex digital age. Their findings speak not only to journalists, but to all who are concerned about receiving reliable information that contains accurate facts. The project was supported by the Carnegie Corporation and the Knight Foundation. What I want to do is make an argument um, that uh, journalists need to know more uh, than they do now. Uh, if they're to provide the kind of news that we need uh, for our democracy. And this is not a new argument. Uh, many of you are familiar, I'm sure, with Walter Lippmann's uh, classic public opinion, now nearly a century old. It was a major theme uh, of his book. And it's an argument that journalists have made uh, over the decades. Uh, Tom Wicker of the New York Times said, Lack of expertise is one of the things most seriously wrong in journalism. And what he was referring to was the fact that unless journalists know their subject area, they're very vulnerable to their sources, the people on whom uh, they depend for information. And underlying these criticisms, I think, is uh, a rather unique feature of journalism as a profession. If you think about professions, for the most part, they're defined by a body of knowledge. Uh, so to be a physician is to know medical science. To be a lawyer uh, is to know a body of law. To be an economist means that you know macroeconomic theory, microeconomic theory. There is no equivalent uh, for the journalist. Uh, there is no body of knowledge that, that underlies the practice of journalism. It's primarily about uh, the ability, and it's a, it's a substantial skill, I'm not saying that. Uh, it's the ability to gather, uh, put together, uh, disseminate uh, news, uh, and, and that puts journalists to some degree uh, at a vulnerability uh, in what they do. Uh, during the uh, first Gulf War, uh, there was a sign in the uh, Pentagon press office uh, that greeted journalists. It said, welcome temporary war experts. Uh, and that pretty much sums up how journalists kind of interface with their sources. In almost every case, uh, the source knows more about the subject matter uh, than they do. Uh, it would be as if somehow you went in your doctor's office and you know more about medicine uh, than your doctor. You probably wouldn't go back. So it's a long-standing problem, but I think it has uh, a new urgency. For one thing, uh, sources are increasingly less trustworthy. Uh, our politics is full of spin. It's full of PR. Ben Bradley, to whom I owe my chair at Harvard, said that politicians have become a bunch of liars. Uh, I think that's uh, an overstatement on Ben's part. Uh, but I think he's got the trend right, uh, that increasingly, uh, you know, our politics is a politics of spin. Uh, and that doesn't work well for journalists. Uh, and when politics becomes uh, full of spin, uh, then we have what the journalist James Fellows calls false equivalencies, where truths, half-truths, outright lies kind of sit kind of in the same place uh, in the mix of news. Uh, and you can see that, and you've seen that uh, quite frequently over the last decade. Uh, when the allegation broke during the 2009-2010 health care reform debate that the legislation contained death panels, that went around uh, the news pretty rapidly. Uh, and it was not uh, until several days into uh, that coverage that basically journalists kind of figured out that there were no death panels uh, in that legislation. Uh, but there was a point, and a lot of that, of course, was fed by talk shows and not by the news, but there was a point in the debate where about half the American public uh, thought that the legislation contained these death panels, these commissions that would determine at the end of life whether elderly would be entitled to more, uh, to more medical care. Uh, and it's still the case in polls that about 20% of Americans think that that's part of the, of the legislation. 
A second reason why I think there's a new urgency uh, is that policy problems are increasingly complex. Uh, there are large areas of public life that are difficult to report on, and in fact go underreported because journalists don't understand those policy areas well enough. Uh, the Washington Post, Walter Pincus said recently uh, that he was hard pressed to think of a single journalist who really understood education policy really well. Again, that may be an overstatement on Walter Pincus's part, but if you look at education reporting, uh, we get reporting on kind of testing and where we sit kind of nationally and internationally in testing. We get reporting on uh, the rising costs of higher education, but then there are large areas of education as important as that issue is to American life, that simply go underreported. I think insufficient knowledge also stunts the reporting of things that are pretty much right in front of journalists. Uh, one of my favorite examples uh, is a study that was done at our center uh, by a journalist, not a scholar. Matt Storen, who had been editor of the Boston Globe, uh, came to our center the semester after 9-11. And he had watched the coverage on 9-11 in the days immediately after. And uh, he was surprised that journalists seemed almost at a loss to tell the American public what was going on, or what might be going on with 9-11. Uh, and so he went back and he looked at the reporting before 9-11. He looked at the coverage of the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. He looked at the coverage of the 1998 bombing of the two US embassies in Africa. Uh, the bombing of the USS Cole uh, in Yemen Harbor in 2000. And what he found was that the reporting was very good on the what, the where, the when. So pretty good about the damage that was done, how many people were injured, how many people were killed, uh, <clears throat> what was used uh, in those attacks. Uh, but very little attempt to kind of connect the dots, uh, whether there was some kind of pattern that was going on here. Uh, he looked at also at the several dozen other less major terrorist attacks that had occurred in that decade before 9-11. And the journalists almost always kind of ignored the possibility that something larger than single instances, episodes, were taking place. And there was very little reporting on the political, cultural, religious underpinnings of this growing transnational terrorism that was coming out of the Middle East. Uh, and then you looked at the when Clinton fired the cruise missiles. Uh, you know, and that, that became a wag the dog story, uh, rather than uh, that there might be something here that we ought to be paying attention to. And then in the year before 9-11, uh, the Hart-Rudman Commission uh, that warned uh, of a catastrophic terrorist attack on American soil uh, went unreported uh, in the American press. When the CIA director appeared in an open hearing in the Senate and said that Al-Qaeda is basically the major enemy, the major threat to the United States. Washington Post didn't carry a story on that. The New York Times had it, but it was stuck in the middle of a story in the middle of the A section. Uh, in the year before 9-11 on ABC, NBC, and CBS, there was one reference uh, to Al-Qaeda uh, during that entire year. Journalists were not covering that story. We're not thinking about uh, that particular development. And then, of course, on 9-11, we're pretty much at a loss to tell us what might be going on. And we had very bad reporting uh, going into Afghanistan. Uh, you'd have thought that Pakistan was an old friend of ours and entirely reliable and all of that from that early reporting. Uh, just an understudied, underreported uh, development that was extremely important uh, to our national life. And then a third reason, I think, we need better journalism as to offset uh, the noise and the nonsense uh, in our information system. Uh, when cable came along, uh, we were all pretty enthusiastic about it. Uh, you know, 24-hour news, this idea that you could get news around the clock. The internet comes along and uh, we're enormously enthusiastic about that. The barriers to entry uh, had been lowered in terms of getting voices into the information system. But these haven't turned out quite the way uh, that we thought they would. Uh, cable is largely talk shows, and uh, the influence of cable is primarily in that particular area. And on the internet, uh, what seems to work politically is outrage, uh, that most of the blogs that can attract, uh, get, get traffic are, are those that kind of traffic left or traffic right. Um, and I think the best evidence that we have that this new information system uh, isn't quite working the way we wanted to. It may, in fact, be working against 
what we're trying to do in terms of informing the public is that the rising levels of misinformation. Before the Iraq invasion, half the American public thought that Saddam Hussein and uh, Osama bin Laden were allied against the United States in the war on terrorism. Uh, or uh, currently on global warming, there was a poll about uh, two months ago where almost half of Americans uh, either say that global warming isn't happening, or if it is happening, it's due to natural causes rather than to human activity. Uh, and it's very difficult, I think, uh, to have meaningful public debate, public discussion, if you can't even get agreement uh, on the facts. And increasingly, what we find in the American public is confusion and misinformation around the facts. And we need a type of journalism, in my view, uh, that can anchor uh, public opinion, that can serve as a trustworthy and reliable source of relevant information about public affairs. But increasingly, uh, we don't get it. We get a lot of infotainment. Infotainment is not innocent in the sense of having no effect on the public. Uh, for people who live in a community that they have a television affiliate that really pumps up crime, you know, where they start the news show with uh, one crime story and it's followed by another crime story and so on, the viewers of those channels have an exaggerated sense of crime in their community. Uh, so these things are not simply kind of nice things in terms of affecting the marketplace and attracting viewers and the like, but they do in fact shape part of what we think is going on out there in the world. So what would it take uh, to put a firmer foundation under journalism? First of all, I think it would require journalists to give up the fiction uh, that somehow uh, interviews and observation are adequate to reporting. Uh, that's been the tradition. Uh, when something breaks, uh, if you're near the scene, you go and observe what happened. You get on the phone or you go see people, you interview them. Those are important devices, they're important tools for the journalists, but I don't think they go far enough. I think the journalists need to know more. Uh, we're seeing some changes in that direction. If you look at newsrooms and the composition of newsrooms, uh, it's still the case that only about 5% of American journalists have an advanced degree in a substantive area that's related to their reporting but that's much better than it was 20 years ago, and that's the direction that many newsrooms are going, particularly the larger ones, uh, where they're requiring or they're looking for journalists who have advanced training in the areas that they're reporting on. But I think where we really need to look uh, for change is the journalism schools. Um, and this was what we did with the Carnegie Knight initiative that we had. Our center at Harvard worked with 11 of the top journalism schools in the country to see whether in the training of journalists, uh, you couldn't bring knowledge more fully into that training. Uh, to make knowledge kind of as secondhand to the journalist when they think about a reporting situation as is thinking about, well, I've got to go interview somebody or I've got to go see what happened with this particular situation. Uh, and I won't go into the details of that particular program, but it did in fact show that it can be done. It's not easy. Uh, it's always hard to change the way that things are customarily done uh, in an institution. Uh, but it is possible to bring knowledge to bear uh, in the training of journalists and then they take it with them. It becomes kind of secondhand for them. Um, and uh, that is not part of the tradition of the American uh, journalism school training. Uh, many of them do not even require statistical literacy. It's very difficult uh, today in my judgment uh, to report accurately. Uh, and in many areas of public life, if you don't know the numbers. Doesn't mean that journalists have to be able to create the numbers, but they've got to be able to interpret them accurately uh, in order to tell us precisely what developments mean. There are many others who are kind of thinking along the same lines that have been kind of pushing this particular argument. Uh, I think it's gonna take a long time uh, for this to take hold. This kind of institutional change does not take place overnight. Uh, it was in New York City, uh, where yellow journalism a century ago was in its heyday, and it was kind of journalism by almost any means. You know, if you, have, if you need sex to sell something, you use sex. If you need outrage to do it, you use outrage. Well, it took about two or three decades uh, for that model to change and to get this, what we call objective journalism, which is a more sober, more fact-based, uh, more fairly balanced kind of journalism. It took about that long for that kind of journalism to take hold. I think this kind of change will take a similar like, long period of time. But I think if journalists uh, don't begin to change, uh, they're going to find further erosion of their audience uh, and further erosion of their status. Uh, the public's trust in journalists is now at about the level 
of their trust in Congress. Which one's at the bottom depends a little bit on how people are feeling at the moment about Congress, but uh, sometimes it's journalists who are at the bottom of the... Uh, but there's some real dangers out there to me. I think journalists are fundamentally important uh, to the functioning of democracy, that we need this intermediary. Uh, we need these people who can kind of interpret for us what's going on. Some of that interpretive function, some of that sense-making function is now moving in other directions. Um, last uh, Friday, uh, I, I met in my office with an individual from Australia. Uh, and he runs a, a site that uh, is now up to 1.4 million uh, visitors a day. Uh, and who are the reporters? The reporters are experts. Uh, there's not a single reporter on staff in that organization. They have 20 editors, and they have about 25,000 experts. Uh, and as things develop, uh, as the events come up in the news, uh, the people who are writing about it are not the reporters, uh, but they're scholars, policy experts, and the like. Uh, and they have 20 editors to kind of put, put those reports in shape. Uh, but they've gone from zero five years ago, 400,000 one year ago, to 1.4 million today, and this is in a country of 25 million. So right now, it's one of the largest news sources in that country. It's not unthinkable. You could see similar developments here and elsewhere, uh, and that leaves the journalists out of the equation. Uh, but uh, in my own view, uh, there's real value in having professionals uh, who are in the business uh, of thinking about what's going on out there, trying to make sense of us, and then telling us what's important about those developments. Uh, that's the kind of journalism and journalists that we need. And I think that's where we have to move, uh, along with the other aspects of the business model, uh, if we're to really put a firm foundation under this area of our democracy. Thank you. You gave the most encouraging example uh, of Australia, where experts are being used to comment on the news. But the more general situation is that anybody can write a blog and make comments and, oh, and, and so forth. So how do you deal with this? How do you steer people to the more informed opinions? Some of what's happened, I think, is irretrievable. Uh, there was a study done recently about, uh, it was a longitudinal study that looked at uh, reasons why people have kind of abandoned traditional news sources. One of the reasons has been this really concerted attack on one side of the political spectrum uh, to undermine traditional media by accusing them of bias, partisan bias. Uh, and the perception of bias on the part of a citizen decreases their trust in the traditional media and makes them more likely to go find an alternative source that, in fact, supports their own bias, right? So that's one. But the other thing that's undermined uh, people's trust in, in, uh, in the media and has led to some movement away from uh, exposure to news is uh, infotainment and this idea that, you know, somehow the news has to include celebrity and all of these other dimensions to it. Um, and what that was was a pretty deliberate strategy on the part of news organizations to hold on to the marginal news consumer. And that did work to some degree in the short run uh, in terms of holding on to some of those marginal viewers, but it did alienate as well some in the core audience, uh, and they've kind of moved out. Uh, now, I like experts. I mean, I obviously think that I'm somewhat of an expert in some kind of narrow area, but I, I think experts, too, have their blinders. One reason I, I like to have journalists in the mix, if they're doing it well, they act as correctives for us as well. You need someone looking over uh, the shoulder of whoever's making the claim. You know, you need, you need some verification process, and journalists need to be part of that, right? And that's the trouble that I have with the Australian model. Uh, I think it's, it, it's quite an extraordinary and very interesting development. Uh, but uh, 25,000 experts in that country, I doubt it. Uh, you know, I, just, I, I begin to think that there's some non-experts who have slipped into that, into that mix, and, uh, and the information that they're providing probably isn't very reliable. But so how, how, do you sort that, how do you sort that process out? Uh, I wondered if you might comment on the relationship between sources and reporters. It's not unheard of for sources to use, if not to abuse, reporters. And how might reporters protect themselves from this? 
Well, one of the arguments that I have for knowledge-based journalism is you can't protect yourself if you don't know the subject matter. Right. So uh, if you're interviewing someone and you don't have some understanding of the subject area, you're pretty much defenseless in that situation. Uh, now, it doesn't mean that you have to go out and simply report verbatim what you were told. Uh, but you can't simply kind of suspect something might be wrong with what you were told. If you, if you can't essentially say what the problem is with the argument, where the facts actually lie, uh, you're pretty much in trouble. And then you're going to do what's the easy thing, especially if your editor is pushing you for the story. You're going to put that quote uh, into the story, and you're going to use that framing. Uh, and the, you may balance it out by calling someone on the other side of the fence and getting kind of their take on the same situation and let that be the kind of the corrective. Although, quite frequently in that situation, you've got two falsehoods sort of side by side and letting the, letting the audience decide which of the two falsehoods they like better. Uh, and we know what they do in those situations. Uh, Republicans and Democrats tend to choose different falsehoods when they have the choice between two of them. Uh, so that, you know, I think that, I think in journalists increasingly have to know uh, the subject area well enough uh, to basically act as a corrective in those kind of situations. And then they have to have the courage, uh, and it's very difficult in a profession where jobs are scarce and tenuous, uh, you know, to say, uh, to play it straight, you know, to, to call their sources to account uh, for the half-truths and sometimes outright lies that they get from their sources. Uh, and once in a while they'll do that, but at some cost. Uh, an example of that is Dana Milbank from the Washington Post, who was the Post's uh, White House correspondent. and. Uh, somewhere about 2005, 2006, I don't remember the exact date, uh, said that the White House was pretty good at uh, manufacturing facts um, in a front page story in the Post. And uh, guess what? Uh, you know, for months, you know, he would raise his hand at the White House press conference and they'd never call on him. And, you know, when the president would take a trip and that plane would trail along with journalists, he was never invited to be one of the journalists that was on the, the trailing aircraft. So. You know, there's a cost to be paid uh, by calling uh, public figures to account for what they say. But, uh, you know, what are the, what's the alternative? I mean, in this world of spin and PR, uh, you know, you can't simply pass that along to the American public. We're seeing the effects of that. Uh, you know, we've got Americans, Democrats, and Republicans in a lot of policy areas now living in two different worlds. They have a different set of facts. And it's one of the reasons you can't close that gap. If you can't get people on a somewhat firm foundation, some agreement about what the facts are, it's really hard to move to the next stage in the debate and in the argument. It seems that knowledge-based journalism assumes lots of agency from the journalists. They should be more, they should educate themselves to report better. Well, I, it seems to me there are bigger forces affecting the job of the journalist as business, like the owners, the business model, uh, politi politic forces, how, do, how, does, how those forces affect, in the end, what a journalist can do in his profession? Yeah. No, I, I, you're absolutely right, and it goes to some of the other questions that have been asked. I mean, those are, those are huge forces out there, and uh, you know, it depends on how you count, but by one accounting, uh, there are a third fewer journalists today than there were 10 or 15 years ago. That uh, gives you a sense of the amount of attrition that's occurred in traditional news organizations. So there's a lot of pressures, I think. Uh, and in part, that's, I think, the reason why we place so much emphasis on the education process. You know, that's the point where these kinds of pressures are less intense. I mean, the minute you graduate, of course, you get into that world of quite intense pressures. And obviously, whether there's anything out there for you after you've spent four years of your life doing this. But I, I think that's where we think the real change is going to take place. Uh, it's much harder to learn these things on the job. Uh, and in some ways, that was the answer, or part of the answer to the old problem of yellow journalism, the Columbia Journalism School, the School of Journalism at Missouri. You know, those were kind of founded in part in response to or in reaction to this runaway journalism uh, that you could see on the streets of New York during the great newspaper wars of the late 1900s and early 20th century. So um, I, uh, those are undeniable forces, and they're big ones, right? And uh, other schools have done this. I mean, it's not like you can't make the change. 
Uh, about a half century ago, business schools faced pretty much the same kind of challenge. I mean, the business school model was uh, largely a faculty that had been out in the business world and came back into the university uh, and basically talked about their lessons learned. Uh, and if you look at business schools today, that's still much of what they teach, and they should. Just as if you look at a journalism school faculty, a lot of the faculty members are former journalists, right, who have come into the classroom now to, to pass on the lessons that they learned uh, while they were active in the, in the news industry. But what the business schools did was to say, that's not enough. Uh, we've got to also bring economics into our curriculum. We've got to bring organizational and management theory into our curriculum. They fundamentally kind of redid uh, what uh, a business school education looks like. Right. Uh, it wasn't easy. Uh, it's never easy to kind of bridge those divides, make those connections. And if you look at the studies, and they're, they're still studying it 50 years later or so, uh, there's still some problems with it. it, it it's, it's not easy. But uh, there's no one today in a journalism school would say, we've got to go back to where we were 50 years ago. That's unthinkable. Well, thank you for being so relevant, trustworthy, and informative. Thank, thank you, Tom. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.